Hey guys, it's KJ with Board Life Coaching, and I'm here today with Hamilton Cabral. He was a 1996 U.S. hopeful uh, in the 200. Correct. 200, and he was actually invited to Dean Oregon to uh, to compete for the Olympics. And I wanted him to tell you his story because I wanted you to I wanted you to get a better feel for the picture of what happens along the way and how um, how important strengthening, conditioning, knowing your body, everything else is. Or an athlete. So thank you, Hamilton. No, oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. Thanks for inviting me. <laughs> um, I think we we're like before we were talking about the um I got invited to uh the 1996 Olympic trials, but um working out, I was still in season at my university in track season. So while practicing for like the next meet, I was trying to fine tune you know, a specific part of my race. And during that point, you know, I pulled my hamstring, um, the injury and my season was over for the track and field that year, but also my hopes for, um, for Eugene, uh, was, was dashed. Now, when I got the invite, all of my family back home found out that I got invited. So everybody was uh, pre in Moxville. In Moxville. In Moxville. So the whole <laughs> town of Moxville. That's the news. Whole town, of, whole town of Moxville. You know, where they stopped the town for, for sporting events, so to speak. Um, also, they were uh, in Winston. Everybody had their expectations. People were saying that they wanted to go to not the Olympic trials, but the Olympics. You know, they were already uh, feeling like they wanted to make plans. My doctor was telling me how he was going to be there. So, I felt like I had the world on my shoulders. I felt like now because of, and I felt like it was something that I did because I did that one more repetition, so to speak. Um, and I felt like it was something that I did to let everybody down. So the voices came back of- but Wait, wait, explain the one more repetition. What do you mean? Yeah, one more repetition. Um, we were doing, uh, we were running intervals of 150 meters. Um, that's, uh, the middle of the curve and one hole straight away of a of a track and um we were doing i think we were doing like eight and um we were finished and uh but when i was doing it i was working on a specific part the part that i was working on is the transition from the curve to the straightaway to make it as smooth as possible because i i was having problems with that so we were done and um, I wanted to do, I needed to do one more to work on that just to get it right because it still wasn't right. We had competition. And um, when I did that, I pulled a hamstring. And so explain like to I me, said, pull the hamstring. What does that mean? Like you're, you're running and then all of a sudden you feel the pain and you fall to the ground or yeah, were you, you at the start or were you in the middle of the end? Huh? No, you fall, you fall right there because you can't, you, uh, your muscle, your hamstring muscle is a, a group of muscles um, on the back side of your upper leg, your, uh, your back of your thigh. And I pulled the muscle where um, you pull it, it's a, where it's attached, it comes um, away from that attachment or it can tear. And mine came away from where it was attached, you know, a little bit. And, um, and so where it was, was it attached at your hip or your knee? It was attached. It was attached up closer to where my hip was, and so um, it wasn't enough that I needed surgery, but it was enough that I couldn't run. <laughs> and so the times that I had that I had to make and everything for to even be considered and be on the track with anybody for the next meet was done. Um, no less people that were going to run in the Olympics. So now, um, everything that you know, I went through as far as not feeling like I was enough, you know, through life, all of that came back. So it was not just one, one point of pain, so to speak. Um, when I'm saying pain, I'm talking about mental and emotional pain right now, not the physical. Um, it wasn't just one specific point. It was layers and layers and layers of, I feel like, disappointment i feel like i'm not good enough i feel like um, i'm letting everybody down i feel like um it was but it was always i'm not good enough for everybody it was always i'm not 
um, living up to what they think. It was never about what I thought. It was never about uh, my expectations based on this is my goal. This is what I'm, I'm willing to do. I've been working for this goal. It was never that. It was when to be accepted or when so they'll be happy. It was always somebody else. The so, motivation was always somebody else. Two questions. Mm -hmm. One, when you say somebody else, like how many is that somebody else? Two, three other people? And then number two is how far back? Are these expectations from a week ago, a month ago, a year ago? Those two things. Right. Um, it was probably, you can center it around immediate family as far as uh, how many. It feels like the world because um, when you're they thinking are your about- They are your world. Yeah, they are your, my world. But then it's a, it's a, it, it could, when you're focused on that, it becomes a paranoia because it's not only them, that's the, that's the nucleus, but it's the track team, it's the university commit, uh, community, it's the people back at home. So it's, it starts with a nucleus of those people, but then it spirals out. Then it feels like, because you gotta understand, um, like I said, track, coaches from other universities came to me and was saying, we tried to figure out what to do with you. You know, in our practices, we were focused on how to beat you. And so now they come into play because it's their opinions. So it's just, it just, um, well, splinters out, you know, um, unnecessarily because it's, it's, it's good to set standards for yourself and work hard to reach them. Is not good to have that unnecessary pressure on you because that's imaginary pressure. That's what I feel like they think. And it's not necessarily what they think. It's all wanting to be accepted. What do you think? And that's what I had to do. I had to sit down and face me. I had to see what do you like? What are your real expectations of yourself? What do you really like to do? You know, and so once and how I many did, years, how many years would you say this was mounting? Oh, wait, I think, what was I, 19, 20 at the time? So I guess I would say maybe 15, 14, 15 years. It was back to when I was, when, when you were young enough for people to put expectations on you and you realize that they have it um, inadvertently, yeah. And those expectations grow minutely, yes. exponentially, or, you know. Minutely. They they grow and those are dangerous because you don't feel them growing, and you don't know that they they're growing. You know um, you don't know that you're you're trying to please people um, because it's become a part of you. And here's the scary thing: because it grows so slowly and minutely, you feel like it's your thought. You feel like their expectations of you originated in you, and they did not. They originated outside of you and was planted in you and you accepted it, right? Because you didn't know any better. And that's when I say you, I mean me. I didn't know any better. So I felt like what people said about me, what was going on around me in the world was my thought. You know what I mean? Um, something is, is little. No, go ahead. Right? Something as little as, uh, for example, um, and you eat a lot, right? Is uh, because when I was at certain uh, uh, family dinners, like extended family dinners and things like that, you know, he gonna eat everything on his plate because he always does. Because somebody was watching what I ate. It could have been one time where it was just something that I dish that I like. And it was the only thing that I, you know, I was hungry that day or whatever, but because they saw that they made a comment. Now other people are making comments. Oh yeah, he eats a lot. He eats a lot. He eats. A so now guess what I think? I think I eat a lot. Why? I think it's my thought. I think, yo, I, I got one plate of food. I didn't get enough. Why? Because I eat a lot. That's what I do. That wasn't something that was an original thought. That was a thought that was planted and I accepted. And um, so many things happen like that for so many people. I, I find that's not your thought. But when it happens minutely, you think it is. You feel like it is. And, it, and sometimes people don't even realize that you're listening when you're listening. 
So they may think that they're talking to somebody else about you, or they may think that they're talking in general on the phone, but all those things are still, if you're an empathetic person and you care, like you said, like you, you care, you want to help, you're a nurturing person, you know, I care, I'm nurturing, I want to help. All those things, you still hear. Right. Because in order to really and truly comprehensively help somebody, you have to hear the small details, right? right? The small details are what makes the glue and makes it all make sense. Right. Exactly. And when unhealthy. You, go ahead. Go ahead. No, 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 go ahead. Go ahead. And when it's unhealthy, you know what I mean? When you don't know where to place that, um, it comes out um, devastating to you because now. What does devastating look like? What, 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 what was your lowest low? I'm trying to what please everybody. Yeah, my devastating, um, whew, we didn't get to my lowest lows. <laughs> uh, but yeah, my lowest lows was when my uh, my sister passed. I told you my lowest lows, my sister passed and my brother passed. And like- Wait, your when, sister and your brother? Yeah, yeah my, my sister passed when, yeah. Yeah, it was, it was, it was, it was rough. My sister passed, you know, she was 20. My brother passed, he was, um, he, he was 39. Uh, both of them passed. It was unexpected when they did, but you know, yeah, they passed, and um, it was like my lowest low was when that happened because it was compound. It wasn't that I wasn't devastated when my sister passed, and I wasn't devastated when all these other events happened. I was um, when my brother passed. It was like that's it. You know what I mean? And so I lost the taste. I remember telling somebody for things. When I say taste, the affinity, I didn't want to train. I didn't want to personally train anybody. I didn't want to work out myself. I lost the taste for life, so to speak. The thing that made that, that I felt like I was living, I lost that. That's after I found out that I liked helping people. Um, if I didn't, it was, it was damaging. When I didn't know I liked helping people, I tried to please people because like you said, you're empathetic and you feel. So when I feel or I see certain things, I would try, I used to try to please them because that's going to make them feel better if they're pleased, right? So now you're a people pleaser, but we know that doesn't work and it beats you down. And so now I realize, oh, I know what I like and I know who I am. I want to help people. In they my may, lane, help people in my, in my lane. lane. So now they may not actually, some people may not ever thank you for helping them. They might not realize it, but um, that, hey, you you took a burden off or whatever. Oh, I feel better. They just, I feel better talking to you or something like that. You're helping them by, well, for me, by encouraging, you're helping them in your lane. Um, so I'm not pleasing them because when you're helping somebody, they, it may not always feel good to them, so to speak, but you're helping them out of love, you know, and you know when and it's a balance, you know how far to go and how when to pull back and how far to go. And sometimes you pull back when they want you to keep coming, but it's not, it's not beneficial if you do. And so, but fast forward back to when my brother passed, I already found that out about me. So now when my brother passed, I didn't feel like doing that anymore. I didn't feel like helping out anybody anymore. I was, I was, and I had, and that one, you had, I had to really fight to come back to even start helping people or even, I mean, because when people will come, you say, okay, I know they need help. <laughs> you see it. Because once you start doing, you recognize certain things. When people start trying to pull, so to speak, on you by saying they're coming to you and they're talking and you, and things come up in you to encourage. And when you, I'm not saying that. When you refuse to say it or start to refuse to say it or try to refuse to give them an encouraging word, when when you clearly feel that encouraging word, you know, um, that's where I was. That's where I started, started to be. That was the lowest low. And, you know, I was like, I can't. That person had nothing to do with any, you know, any of this. You know, so I started to encourage through my pain. While I was still, I had to uplift someone who lost someone to death while I was still grieving and not understanding why I had to experience that death in my family. Mm. Yes. 
God, God, God will take you there. God will, right. he will, he will, he will challenge you just to show you how strong you right. are, you know? Right. And a lot of the time, and some of the times too, and I, I've heard it said before, and um, I guess I got the, the, the blessing, blessed opportunity to experience. Sometimes he'll give you the answers that you need while you're giving the answers to someone else. You know what I mean? Speaking through you to somebody else. Now, the thing that you needed, you hear it in the answer. So both of you are being helped by that saying, by you doing what you're supposed to do, by you doing, for me, by me encouraging someone, the things that I needed encouraging on, the things, the answers that I needed, some of the times were given to me while I was giving them that encouragement. Had I not done that, they wouldn't have been encouraged and I would have still been in the funk. <laughs> My challenge is I'm an educator, you know, I, I, growing up, my dad was a staunch Republican. My mom was a staunch Democrat. And so they would go toe to toe in conversations. Oh yeah. My dad, you know, country farmer, rifle, everything, but also worked on wall street. And so my mom, you know, nurturing teacher. I mean, like if you could, if, if, if you wanted a poster child for Republican and a poster child for Democrat, they were it. I mean, you wouldn't right. know unless if you really started to engage them in conversation about politics, but I mean, they were really and truly understood their parties and their party beliefs. So if I wanted to come to the table with things a lot of times, I had to do my work. I had to do my research. Right. Because I had one right. point this way, one point, and my, and my, I'm sorry, wait, let me just say this. My parents were best friends. They were married yeah. to them. Like even oh, after my mom died, every single day, my dad said, I want to die and go be with with Shell, my mother, you know, my mother. So for nine months, every day, he wanted to die and go be with my mother. So mm-hmm. they were very, very, very close. But the thing was, once again, you could not come to them without knowing your, without doing your research. Exactly, exactly, yeah. So, so it's amazing to me that God will put me in environments where I've done the work, I've done the research, I've done the studying, I, I you know, I, I have the validation, everything else, but he puts me in front of people that don't want to learn. You yeah. know what I mean? And so, you know, at some point in time, you're like, you know, God, why am I, why am I teaching to this wall? Why am I, why am I teaching and, and doing all this in this environment where it's not being received? And the funniest thing is sometimes it's not the person that I'm talking directly to, but it's the person on the side that pulls me aside and says, Hey, look, I heard what you just said. Can you help? Right. So right. that, that showed me my purpose and what I was doing that sometimes, even though I'm espousing to people who don't get it, right. there's somebody in the peripheral that needs it. That needs right? it. They need it. I mean, they, they need it. Yeah. You know what I mean? They need it. So, yeah. so I keep going in my lane. I don't, and before I was like, oh, you know, let me try and research this and let me try. This. No, I'm going in my lane. Uh-huh. And my lane is, you know, social, physical, cognitive skills, strengthening for readiness. Like, how do we get ready? So that is my lane. So I stay in my lane and um, try to help people, try to help educate people on the fact that there are, are, there's a variety of health conditions and there's a variety of solutions. And I do that in a world where people think that there's one, one, you know, I do this for people who've been in an environment where they believe there's only one condition or one solution. So what I try to do is broaden the spectrum because there are people out here that are hurting because their true needs are not being met, you know? So I want them to be validated in the fact that, no, you're right. You're right. You don't necessarily fit into this bracket, but let's let's help you find the bracket that you do fit into. You know, let's give you a wider spectrum of stretch. So, um, but I get what you're saying. And what you're saying is so, so powerful. And you're at the lowest. And you said you got to your, your higher realm by just walking in your. Yeah. Yeah. Walking in what I do, uh, which is encouraging people, which is um, helping people. Um, instead of running from it, walking in it, embracing it. Um, that's why uh, I have this. I, I read this thing and it was called win the day. And um that's how I did it. I'm not, oh, <laughs> I lived that. And in some cases, sometimes I still have to live it. What I mean by that is um, some people say day by day. Sometimes uh, I say 
God, I'll give you, I can promise you that I'm going to so sorry. try to encourage you. No, you're fine. I'm going to try to encourage or I'm going to try to live this minute. I'll give you this minute. I can promise this minute. I can't promise the next minute. I can't go day by day. I got to go hour by hour or minute by minute sometimes. And that's sometimes I, you know, I really literally had to do that. But yeah, try to win. I tried to win mentally and emotionally that day. And then I felt if I string enough of those days along, you know, you got a life going on. So um, that's what I, you know, I did. I, I broke it down to um, a, a negative thought comes in, you know, I let it float by, but I, I, I put positive thoughts in there. What is going to make me smile? Even if it's seeing a, if it's seeing a baby laugh or something that puts a smile on my face, if it's a certain type of music that puts a smile on my face and brings me back to peace, peace is the benchmark. And if it brings me back to peace, um, that's what I would do if I had an, if I had a negative thought, but I, sometimes, you know, it was some days where I lost those days. <laughs> it was some days where I felt beat down and tired, but, um, as I went and as I went with the model and the mindset of winning that day, win the day, as I went with that, I had more days that I won than more days that I lost. And that's how I got back to, you know, my bubbly laughing, um, jovial self, uh, as far as being from my lowest low, because it was a compound low. That's why it was so um, low, devastating. What I mean by that, like you said, it wasn't just, okay, my brother passed. It was, he passed. I didn't make the Olympics. My sister passed, you know, this, 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 you know, things like that. It, everything came flooding. and it was just a stacking on top of each other. And it was just, that was it. But you know, you have at that moment when my brother passed, I got a family. I got a wife, I got two girls, two daughters. And so you, there's no checking out. There's no off. <laughs> there's no. Um, there's and that's no, the blessing just, of family. That's yeah. the blessing of family because God is giving you purpose. He reminds you right. of purpose. Right, right, right. And it helped out. I mean, it, it really, it really did. Cause there's no, you got to figure out, okay, there is no quit. There is no stop. So you have to try to figure out if I'm not going to stop, how can I take those, that energy that wants me to stop and turn it into how can I make it better instead of how can I avoid all of this? Cause it's when you have something that you do innately, like people who cook when they're bored, they cook. When they're frustrated, they cook. You know, when they happy, they cook. So when I, I'll encourage, I'll help people. When it's toxic, I would help people. You know, when it was popular and not popular, I would help people because that's what I did. So to not do that took more effort than doing that. You know, you have to, you have to try. If we go back to cooking, you have to try not to cook. You have to try not to look at the cooking channel or see a recipe and say, well, I wonder how I can make that cookie better. <laughs> you have to try to do that. It takes effort. So instead of using that effort to fight the urge to help, I said, well, let me change that and use that effort to see how can I better help? What can I do? You know, and things like that. What do I have? And so I can help this way. I can help that. I can talk to people. And that's, that's, that's what I've been doing. That's, and that, like I said, day by day though, it's day by day, <laughs> small chunks, that's oh. it. I love it, I love it. And and you ever hear, do you ever hear people say thank you? Sometimes, sometimes. Yeah, sometimes they, and, and sometimes it's a thank you with action. Um, for example, they flourish and then, you know, they'll, you'll see them flourish or, you know, they, they'll do something for you or something like that. But sometimes they say, thank you. Sometimes they don't. Um, but you'll see a different level of communication or a different level of respect. Right. Even, though, even right. though they don't say thank you, you know. Exactly. Exactly. You know that. And um, you can't do it for the thank you. Because one of the things you 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 realize or I come to realize is people have their own perception and their own perspective because we live in a world 
a universe in our mind, right? And you have that. So you don't know what people are thinking and what they're going through. So you can't, you can't dictate what they're going to do. If I'm going to, for me, if I'm going to help you, I'm going to help you. If you need help and I'm going, if you ask me and I'm going to help you, I'm going to help you. Um, if you say thank you, that's a bonus. But the fact that you were helped is the reward for me. And so, uh, you know, you're just like, it's, I liking it to, um, I see someone in the rain um, trying to change their tire. They don't know how to change it. I'm like, it's rain. Oh, now hell is starting to come. This person is physically getting battered by this. <laughs> by the, let me help change their tire because I want them out of that, that environment. That's all I want. I want them on their way. Once they're on their way, I'm happy for them because that environment is switched, right? So the actual helping out is the reward. The thanks is the bonus. I am. Um, growing up, my mom always keep me different people, different economic environments, etc. And my mom would always tell me, she said, I never want you to get so high until you forget how to help, you know, and you forget what's important. Um, just remember during Christmas time, she worked in New Jersey and there were a lot of single moms who did not, you know, single moms, right? Did not have dad support in that. And she would find out about you know, that maybe the moms have a lot of money for Christmas or whatever, she would find out what the kids would, would take Christmas gifts, not only kids, for the moms. Mm -hmm. Felt as though people always look at kids, but they didn't look out for the mom. So if you want the mom to be more enthused or supported or encouraged or whatever along the way, is that you should help them as well as help the children. Yeah. And it's amazing, it was amazing to me because like when my mom passed, and you know, my mom was in North Carolina, she fought in New Jersey, North New Jersey, you know, hadn't seen people in one. Maybe, you know, two weeks later, a month later, people were calling me, telling me the stories about how my mom, them. Wow. Um, mm -hmm. About a year and a half ago, we went to New Jersey to my hometown for something. Mm -hmm. The neighbors was telling my friend about how my mom had helped them. Right. Sometimes, I, the, sometimes the thank yous may not be timely, mm -hmm. but they're still felt and they're still impactful. So yes. You never know what you're doing for now, for later, for mm -hmm. long, for a day. So. Exactly. Exactly. Hamilton, thank you so much for everything. Once again, I this is just a. Uh, Hopefully, prayerfully, this gives some students more insight on how to get through the challenges, you know, an injury, you know, a, a missed opportunity, a missed, you know, great job, you know, a missed, missed accolade. Hopefully, this helps them get beyond that and realize that, once again, as you said, do it day by day. Walk right. in the day. What was your accomplishment today? What was your accomplishment yesterday? And if you look at it that way instead of the... Yeah picture sometimes it, it gets easier right because mm -hmm. maybe you ran your race today and nobody said thank you but you remember ran it you know two weeks ago and your mom was there and all this other right. you know all these other things were there so tomorrow you know you're just striving for another victory exactly exactly did i say that the right way or did i not say that the right way if i didn't say it the right way you tell me no you said it perfectly um because you start out with a big picture but in order to get to that big picture that big goal you have to take it day by day. You don't just start out and say, I'm going to you know, win the Super Bowl or win the Olympics. And then the next day you go win the Olympics. You start with waking up, going to practice faithfully, right? Working on what you need to work on in practice, um, eating right, uh, getting rest. You work on those things, win those. And by the time you get to the big goal, like you do, you said, you're prepared for it. 
Right. And so that's that's part of preparation. And, and so if you, you have said, 100 wins, if yeah. you have 100 wins and 20 losses, right. you still net yeah. 80 wins. Exactly. So you know how to win. <laughs> so you're when you have you have something to pull from, you know, and you focus on the 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 net wins, and 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 you, cause, and you have to enjoy it, you know. I have the thing a lot of times um, on a lot of the stuff that I videos or stuff that I put out and things like that. It's um, work smart, be consistent, and enjoy the journey because you have to work smart and um, you have to be consistent at it. But I've never seen anybody finish like a fitness journey where they want it if they didn't enjoy it. I'm not saying you're going to enjoy every day. I'm not going to say you're going to enjoy every practice or every workout. But if those guys in the NFL, NBA, what they love what they do. If you talk to them, they'll talk about their sport or their trade, like you know, a kid talking about his birthday party, right? They love it. They don't love every practice, but in general, they love that. So you have to love the journey of it and not because I, I haven't seen people make it without loving the journey. I love it. Love the journey. Love the journey. Love that. Never heard that before. Love that. So I'm stealing. It's mine now, Hamilton. <laughs> oh, wait, Hamilton isn't. I told him that beforehand. He copied me, guys. I just want you to know that he, he didn't do that. Didn't do that. <laughs> Love the journey. I'm, I'm stealing that. So, <laughs> Hamilton, once again, thank you. Thank you for this second er excerpt, um, really just and truly discussing how do you get from the lowest of lows to a much higher high. You are a blessing. Oh, thank you so much. You're so sweet. Yeah. And, and guys, hey, look, I can say I know where I interviewed a Hall of Famer. So I just yeah. want to make sure that we put that down <laughs> in the records as well. So yeah. congratulations on your Hall of Fame victory. Congratulations on all the successes that you've done. And um, once again, if somebody needs your information, if you could just share that one more time on how to connect with you with regards to strengthening and conditioning, as you said, you've been through it. You know what it's like. You know what the pain is like. Work with athletes, um, mm -hmm. professional and, and collegiate and high school. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, through the whole spectrum. So you are available virtually and in person. Am I correct? Yes, correct, okay. correct, correct. Yes, um, it's best. One of the quickest and easiest ways to follow me, I'm on IG, Instagram. Um, it's at Hamp, H A M P, athletics. And then on Facebook is Hamilton Cuthro. Or you can email me. It's C U T H R E L L, the letter H as in Henry at gmail.com that's qthrowh at gmail.com those are the quickest ways and most effective ways to get to me and um i'll uh shoot me a dm and i'll get back with you excellent thanks coach oh you're so welcome <laughs> talk Take to you care. later